So just for sake of a review, last week we were in chapter 2, today we're going to be in chapter 3, and then we take a little hiatus until January. And the reason being is because we have a guest speaker next Sabbath, and then Pastor Ben will speak um, Thanksgiving weekend, uh, and then we get into the Easter season, so we're going to take a little hiatus until January, and then restart uh, Esther chapter 4 uh, the first Sabbath in January. Esther has 10 chapters, so we still have quite a ways to go in this journey. But just to give a real short recap from chapter 2, you remember that um, Queen Vashti did something that was disrespectful, and uh, as a result of not coming when King Xerxes asked her to come and parade herself in front of all these drunken men, uh, she basically got booted out. She got booted out, and then after that, Memukin, who was one of the princes, one of his wise, supposedly wise counselors, basically suggested, hey, we can't allow uh, a, a female, we can't allow Vashti to take advantage of you and be disrespectful because then all the women in the province will be disrespectful to their husbands. So she was on her way out, and on its way in was the Miss Persia contest. The Miss Persia contest because the king had to replace Vashti with a new queen. And enter in Esther. Esther comes in and her favorite cousin, approximately 100 years of age, Mordecai, has basically adopted her from her uh, parents who passed away. She was orphaned. And she loves her older cousin, and she's very respectful to her, to him, excuse me. And I shared with you six qualities of Queen Esther, because in chapter 2, she goes from the Miss Persia contest to become the queen. She stood out, not like a sore thumb, but she stood out because of these six qualities, if you remember. And the qualities were that she was filled with charm and with elegance and with grace. She also had a very um, respectful attitude that was filled with restraint and with control, unlike other females in that time. Third, she had a very teachable spirit. She was a young lady that listened to the wisdom of her cousin Mordecai when eventually her cousin told her, shh, don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. She obeyed him. So she had a teachable spirit. She was very modest in her dress, just as Vashti was as well. And number five, she had a Christ-like spirit. Number six, she had respect for authority. That's what we found out in chapter two. In chapter three, part five, we're going to see a villain come onto the scene. And this villain, um, let's put it this way, every drama needs a villain, and the book of Esther does not disappoint, because we will see a power-hungry, egotistical man by the name of Haman enter the scene. We saw Memukin, who was the wise advisor, and who was the one who basically instigated Vashti's exit from being a queen, but now... On the new scene, we have a villain even worse than Mimukin. And Haman, we're going to study something about Haman this morning. Our theme verse is taken from Romans 15, verse 4, says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have what? We might have hope. The Bible is a relevant book. Amen? The Bible is a powerful book filled with truths, and the Bible is the most relevant book known to man. That's why it's still the bestseller. Did you realize that? The Bible outsells any other book in the world, including the Quran, whatever book. And I believe that one of the reasons why the Bible outsells other books is because it is such a relevant book. And this is what we're going to go through in chapter 3. You're going, to see, you're going to see even more relevance. Now we have to remember that the book of Esther teaches us that God is at work and not 
seen. In other words, he's the unseen God. None of us have seen God, right? Has anybody ever seen God? Maybe in a picture that was painted, but you haven't seen God. But God is at work, and that's why I've said that he is the God that is unseen. Amen? So what we're going to study this morning is chapter five, excuse me, chapter three, part five. Part five of this incredible epic book. So Mordecai basically bruises Haman's ego by refusing to bow down to him. And we're going to see that in this entire chapter. We're going to see the results of the fact that Mordecai, Esther's older cousin, does not bow down to Haman. And there are going to be some consequences. I call it a political storm that's going to happen because Mordecai did a no-no. And we're going to get into that no-no starting in chapter 3, verse 1. And you can follow along on the uh, PowerPoint. And it says in verse 1, Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, over all the other nobles. Now it says sometimes later. In another version, it might say something a little different. But sometimes later, because you remember, Memukin was his, the top of the wise men before in chapter 2. So sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, the son of Hag- Hamadatha, the Agatite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. Haman is the right-hand man of King Xerxes. He is powerful. He's like the defense minister, if you looked at it that way. Verse 2. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman. So that shows you how powerful this man is. Bow down to Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. For so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to what? To bow down or show him respect. Now it doesn't mean that Mordecai didn't bow down to other people. Because in scripture... In Esther, I think it's further along in chapter 6 or 7, we will see that he was respectful. But to Haman, he wasn't going to be respectful because he wasn't going to treat Haman like he was a god. Verse 3, then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? The king made Mordecai his right-hand man, the second most powerful person in the empire of Persia. The first time that I went and I visited my dad's boyhood friend who became the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, I said to my dad when he told me, and I was maybe 19 years old, and I said to my dad, I said, Dad, when I go see him in the National Cathedral, I will not call him Father. And my dad was okay with that. I said, I'll call him Mr. Archbishop, Arsobispo. I'll call him Pastor, Pastor, but I will not call him Father. And so when I went to the National Cathedral for the first time and I met him, I called him Mr. Archbishop. He was a family friend of my dad's growing up before he was any Catholic priest or whatever. And I just wanted to fulfill what my dad's wish was. But I didn't bow down to him. I didn't call him father. I was just very respectful by calling him Mr. Archbishop. Haman required people to bow down to him as if he was a god. So in your sermon outline, it says, Sometime later in verse 1, an evil narcissist enters the scene. And first we're going to see this promotion of Haman, who is the evil narcissist. There's going to be three things that we're going to cover. We're going to see the promotion of Haman, the reaction of Mordecai, and then we're going to see the destruction of the Jews, or at least the potential destruction of the Jews. So in verse 2, Mordecai's determination came from his faith in God. His faith in God commanded him not to bow down to Haman like if Haman was a god. And he did not take a poll 
first to determine if that was safe or the most popular course of action. He had the courage to stand alone by faith because he knew bowing down to this man would make it like he was an idol. And we're going to talk about that. You see, sometimes doing what is right will not always make you popular. Amen? Those who do right will be in the minority, like Christians. But to obey God is more important than to, do, to obey people. Amen? Scripture says this in Acts 5.29. Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than whom? Men. Haman was a good Jew. And Haman wasn't going to bow down to this narcissist named, excuse me, Mordecai was not going to bow down to this narcissist named Haman. Now something is going on because we read that Mordecai discovered a plot at the end of chapter 2. You remember last week in verse 22, Mordecai discovered a plot that was going on because he was at the gate. And you remember that I said that when you're at the gate of the palace or the fortress of Susa, that meant that's where the news was going on. That's where the happening was going on. And he heard two people for forming a plot to murder King Xerxes. And so what Mordecai did was he told the new found queen... And he tells Esther, and then Esther goes and tells the king. So basically, Mordecai saved the king's life. And Esther gave him credit for that. But the question is, why is Haman then getting promoted and not Mordecai? That's a question. Haman's ancestors were ancient enemies of the Jews. So we need to understand a little context about Haman and his ancestors. The Israelites were commanded by God to destroy the Amalekites and erase their memory from under heaven. And in Deuteronomy 25, 17, it says, Never forget what the Amalekite did to you as you came from Egypt. When the Jews were liberated from slavery and from bondage in Egypt and, and from the Pharaoh, the Lord is saying to the Israelites in verse 18, They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. And verse 19, Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land he is giving you as a special possession, you must what? Destroy the Amalekites. It's like God was saying to the Israelites, destroy this cancer because this cancer will come back to haunt you if you don't get them first self-defense it's called it was not called murder it was self-defense because the Amalekites took out the Israelites first they attacked them first in the wilderness so as a special possession you must destroy the Amalekites and erase their memory from under heaven never forget this and so the Jews, Mordecai, remembered this. He knew the background of Haman. He knew that Haman was an Agagite, which was a relative of the Amalekites. And so perhaps this is another reason that Mordecai would not bow down before this wicked Haman, because by his act, he it would acknowledge Haman as a god with a small g. You see, the Jews remembered their history. They remembered where they came from. Part of the Passover celebration is remembering how God delivered them. And they remembered the history associated with the Passover. They remembered that the Amalekites went and attacked them in the wilderness. And so Mordecai wasn't about to kneel down and, and revere Haman. Secondly, this is the reaction of Mordecai because of his faith conviction. First, the question was, why was Haman promoted when Mordecai was the one who saved the king's life? But second, now we're going to see Mordecai's reaction. It's kind of like Daniel and his three amigo friends. The same conviction. 
that we must worship God and God alone. Amen? And as Christians, we have the same conviction. That's why the, one of the commandments says, do not worship idols. Do not worship idols because we worship only the one true living monotheistic God. So as Christians, we should never let any person, institution, or government take God's place. When people, are, when people demand their loyalties, like Haman demanded that Mordecai bow down to him, and that everybody would bow down to him, Mordecai said, no way. Not going to do that. My faith conviction in the Ten Commandments, in the God of Israel, is stronger than bowing down to this evil narcissist. So when righteousness rules, justice reigns. Yet when evil lurks in a heart, injustice follows. That's exactly what happens when Haman, of all people, is given authority and promoted. He requires people to be righteous to him. He requires people to, to honor him and and to bow down to him. Verse 4 says, They spoke to him day after day, but still, in other words, they spoke to Mordecai. They spoke to Mordecai day by day, but still he refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct. Since Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. We have a problem, Houston. Because for some reason, the Jews from thousands of years ago have been hated by people. I can't explain it. But maybe I could say that being part of God's people, you're going to have people that hate you. Amen? As Christians are today in this country. I would have never thought growing up that Christians today in the United States are not as respected as before 20 years ago, even maybe 10 years ago. They spoke to Mordecai day after day, but still he refused to comply with the order to bow down to Haman. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with what? He was one angry narcissist. He wasn't going to tolerate disrespect. He wasn't going to tolerate a subject in the kingdom of Persia to show him disrespect. Maybe it was something similar to King Xerxes when Vashti didn't march out and he requested her that he was embarrassed. And perhaps now Haman feels the same way. Because Mordecai's persistent determination, I believe, was was calculated to provoke this type of a reaction because he was a man of faith. He was a man of convictions. He wasn't going to idolize Haman because those who conformed wanted to discover whether any exceptions had been made. And so Haman had to take action. He had to resolve this. Did Mordecai just have a, a bad attitude? No. Mordecai was a Jew. He was a faithful Jew, a practicing Jew, a Jew who honored the what? The Ten Commandments. He honored God. He only bowed down to God, the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to a Jew, bowing down to any person or thing on this earth was considered what? What was it considered? Idolatry. Sometimes I think we go too far in the country, and I like sports. I grew up playing baseball, and, and I went to a public high school. Shame on me, I played football. But I don't idolize professional athletes. Matter of fact, I don't own a jersey that says James on the back. I don't own any jersey that says somebody else's name other than Rosenthal. I'm just that way. I never have wanted to promote somebody else. And maybe it was because of the way I was raised. Amen? I don't care about idolizing professional athletes. I enjoy watching sports. I played sports. But I don't idolize 
the LeBron James or the Matthew Staffords or whomever might be out there. I respect them. I respect them for the profession that they play. But I don't idolize them. Mordecai did not idolize a narcissist because it would have went against his deepest convictions. We can see that Haman enjoyed the power and the prestige of his position, absolutely. And he was enraged, enraged when Mordecai did not respond with a reverential bowing down like he was a god. Mordecai wasn't going to do that as a committed Jew. So Haman's anger was not directed just toward Mordecai, but toward what Mordecai stood for. And it's what you stand for as a Christian that people that aren't Christians in this country or in this world hate Christians because you represent that. You're not going to idolize or bow down to a professional athlete or to a politician. Amen? And so some people will then say, ah, these Christians. Well, Mordecai, because of his faith, wasn't about to bow down and give reverence to Haman. Haman's anger was not directed toward Mordecai, but toward what Mordecai stood for, the Jews' dedication to God as the only authority worthy of reverence. Amen? That's how much integrity Mordecai had in his faith walk with God. Haman's attitude was prejudicial. He had a prejudice not just against Mordecai, but against the people that he stood for, those Jews. And I'm going to get those Jews. It's like that saying that you have heard a number of times. History repeats what? Itself. History repeats itself. You see, prejudice grows out of personal pride, considering oneself better than others. There is a word that we are familiar with, S-I-N, sin. And in English, that middle letter is I, me, myself, and I. We become prejudicial because we think we're better than a different race or a different ethnicity. And Haman was like that. So in the end, Haman was punished for his arrogant, evil attitude, but especially for his actions. And you'll see that when we get into Esther chapter 7. One day God will harshly judge those who are prejudicial and whose pride causes them to look down on others. One of the reasons why this is the greatest country in the world is because there's such a mixture of people. Amen? And that's one of the reasons why this country is so well respected because I've traveled all over the, 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 the world and when people say, do you guys really get along with Orientals and with Hispanics and with Europeans and with Africans and all that? And I said, yeah, for the most part, yes. Exactly. But then there is sin. And unfortunately, sin causes problems. But that's one of the reasons why this is such a great country, because God, I think, has this almost as a, a, as a test, because we're all going to live in heaven with different ethnicities. Amen? Amen? And so we need to learn now on this earth to love each other and to get along with each other if you're a different color, a different ethnicity. Growing up, my brother, who I, who I love, was very light-skinned. So he reminded my dad of my dad's German side. And then I came. And I came a little chocolate-looking. And I reminded my dad of my mother's side. And so I wasn't my dad's favorite. 
growing up. And I realized that. I knew that. My brother went to Gail Goodrich basketball camp. I was very good in baseball, but he didn't send me to any camp. So I knew that my dad favored my brother because he looked more German, and his name was named after a family relative in Germany, Hermann, Hermann, with a double N at the end. How they came up with Jeff is still baffling to me. It just, my mom still cannot pronounce my name. I'm going to tell you a secret, but you cannot tell this or use it against me. My mom says, yes. I, I don't get it. Why didn't she call me Juan? Marco? David? I mean, she comes from Colombia. I'll tell you why. Because one month, my mom came eight months pregnant. I've said this to you when we first started here. I was produced or manufactured in Colombia, exported here. And one month before my mom gave birth, the next door neighbor to my parents was a sweet, godly woman by the name of Betty. And Betty couldn't speak one word of Spanish. But she picked my mom up and took her to prenatal appointments. She couldn't understand. Both of them couldn't understand each other. But my mom was so amazed with this American woman who couldn't communicate with her and yet said, Odilia, I'm taking you to the doctors. And then my uncle would translate and she would, oh, okay. So they named me after Betty and Dave's son, Jeff. Uh, oh well. I always hated the name Jeffrey. Always. And when they ask me what my official name is, it's J-E-F-F, -F because my mom is Hispanic and my dad came from Colombia as well as Germany, R-Y, not E-R-Y. And so people will say, uh, are you sure it's spelled right? Yes, it's J-E-F-F-R-Y. My parents' first language is not English. Oh, well. <laughs> so the reaction of Mordecai leads to the decision of the destruction of the Jews. Therefore, the promotion of Haman, the reaction of Mordecai, now thirdly comes the destruction of the Jews. Haman has it out for, for Mordecai's people. Not just Mordecai, but his people. Because remember, he's an Agagite. He's a relative of the Amalekites. And they know who the Jews were. And so he has it out for them. And so third, the destruction of the Jews in your sermon outline. Verse 6 says, He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on what? On Mordecai alone. He's planning. I'm going to get Mordecai's people. Instead, he looked for every way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. You remember, the empire of Xerxes was from Persia to the Mediterranean, down into Africa, up into the lower part of Europe. It was a large area. Verse 7, so in the month of April... And this is the New Living Translation, so it would be in, um, in your New King James Version, it would say the month of Nisan. During the twelfth year of King Xerxes' reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim, to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. In other words, Haman is planning the extermination of you Jews. I'm going to get you, Mordecai, for not bowing down. I'm going to get you and your people. Haman's anger is described at the end of verse 5. He was filled with what? With what? With rage. He's going to get back at Mordecai. He's going to get you Jews. You're going to pay a price. 
He was so furious that the death of Mordecai would not be enough for Haman. That Haman decided he was going to eliminate the entire people, the entire race called the Jews. Like I said, history repeats itself. I read this remark which says, No proud man ever received the respect and regard which he thought was due to him. You could, you could put that on politicians. You could put that on professional athletes. You see, it wasn't sufficient enough for Haman to have all the servants of, of the king and everyone in the government paying homage to him. That wasn't enough. Haman could not tolerate any insubordination. He needed Mordecai to bow down to him. And he didn't get it. Haman and his anti-Semitic extermination plan begins to take place. From his grandparents to his parents, his uncles and aunts, cousins, Haman the Agagite had what? Don't you believe that you can't learn hate? Because you can be taught hate. My dad learned hate from my opa. When my grandfather immigrated to Colombia, my grandfather did not like black people. He did not like them. And my mom told me, your grandfather, your opa, was a racist. And so my dad learned that until the time when I brought home a friend that was black. And then my dad changed because Reggie loved my dad and my dad learned to love Reggie. But we can learn hate. It's unfortunate from his grandparents to his parents, his uncles, his aunts, cousins, Haman learned hate. It was an anti-Semitic hatred of the Jewish people. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down, show him respect, he was filled with rage. Then in verse 6, Haman looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. He was filled with hate. He wanted to get back at Mordecai and those Jews. I hope we see that's the way evil or sin works. It grows in an exaggerated manner. It's like cancer. It spreads. If you don't control it, it will control you. That's why Haman's not satisfied simply to murder or to do away with Mordecai, but he wants to do away and exterminate the Jews. Haman's on a self-appointed mission. Not unlike Adolf Hitler in the 30s and the 40s to murder all the Jews of Europe. He had to pin the problem in Europe on the Jews and take out those Jews. History repeats itself. Verse 7. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the purr, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. A lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Haman cast lots to determine the best day to carry out his evil decree. Little did he know that he was playing into the hands of God for the day of death that was set almost a year ahead was going to give Esther enough time, enough time, to make her plea to King Xerxes. That's the way God works. We talked about God is a sovereign God. Amen? God is a sovereign God. He's not going to let his people suffer. Amen? And so sometimes when we think that as a Christian, I'm not respected in this country anymore, God's going to protect us. He promises us. There are so many promises in Scripture that tell you and that remind us that He's going to protect us. He's going to see us through to the end. 
The Persian word lots was purim. And I forgot to ask, Brian, is that correct? Okay. <laughs> I meant to call you and ask you that. Which became the name for the holiday celebrated by the Jews when they were delivered and not killed on the day appointed by Haman. You see, what was meant for evil, God worked it out so that the Jewish people today and for many hundreds of years, the most joyful festival that they have is called Purim or Purim. And that reminds them that they were delivered from the evil plans that Haman had to exterminate them. Just like Passover, celebrated for thousands of years because it reminds the Jews that God delivered them from bondage. And so we need to remind ourselves through our holidays, through our special spiritual days as well. We need to remind ourselves that God is merciful, that he's delivered. You're, everyone here has a story, has a story, a spiritual story. Everyone here can say, this is how I became a believer. Whether it's through your family, whether it's through your grandparents, whether it's through an evangelistic crusade, whether it's through a seminar at the church, everyone has a story and you need to remember that story, amen? How you came to know Jesus Christ. How you accepted him. Because that's the beauty of remembering how God delivered you from your past life to a life in Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people scattered through all the province of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people. So you could see the anti Semitic rants, the anger from different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them what? It's not in your interest, King. Let me brainwash you, King Xerxes. Let me convince you that it's not in your interest. King, we need to do something about this cancer. So what does Haman ask the king to do to the Jews? Verse 9, for if it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I, oh boy, now he's a popular man. I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. It's called brainwash. Now he wants to brainwash people because I'm going to give you something. And it's not that he was that rich. He was well off. But he was also going to murder the Jews and go to their homes and steal the money and the silver and everything from them. And then, king, I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver. He was brainwashing. Offering this much money in silver to the king reveals two important facts about Haman. One, he possessed enormous wealth, and two, he expected to recoup his losses by pillaging the murdered Jew's property. That's what he wanted to do. He had already this plan set out. He just had to follow through his plan. Verse 10, the king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger. Because he already brainwashed the king and giving it to Haman, son of, son of Hamadatha, the Agatite, the enemy of the Jews. So now, Haman is not only the right-hand man of the king, the second most powerful man, but now he has the signet ring on his finger. He can sign the decree. He can stamp the decree. Verse 11, the king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. Can you imagine Haman? He's a happy camper. My plan is going to be fulfilled. I will not only get Mordecai, but I will get the Jews. Those overtones here in verse 11 sound a lot like the evil madman throughout history, or madmen throughout history. 
The people are both yours to do with as you see fit. Just look at the evil people in history. Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, you name it, Joseph Stalin, whoever. I'm going to do with the people what I see fit. That's the way madmen act. They plan out these lunatic schemes, but it's to take out the people that are disobedient to them. The people are both yours to do with as you see fit. In other words, just finish them off. Haman comes into this official position ready to pounce, ready to execute his anti-Semitic plan. So this is his moment, and he's going to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, life and pain are synonymous. If you have missed the MindFit meetings the last two nights, I want to encourage you to come tonight. It's not too late. Come tomorrow night. Because pretty much we see that synonymous. Life and pain are synonymous. If you're breathing, you've had pain in this life. That's just the reality of life. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ... You did not read in the Bible that you're going to live a life without pain. You didn't. You read that Jesus died on Calvary's cross to save you for eternal life. Amen? For eternal life. That Jesus gives us promises so that we can get through this life. That Jesus gives us hope that when bad things have happened to us, he will turn it around and help us get through it by his strength. Amen? By his strength. We can escape pain in this life. So if we're not careful that pain can cause us to carry out the most heinous of sins as well. So we see that Haman uses all of his powers. He's a conniving person. He's a malicious person. He's untruthful. He's callous. The reality is that Haman represents the activities of his father. He was taught hate from his grandparents, his father, his family. In John chapter 8, Jesus said to the Jews on one occasion in verse 39, Our father is Abraham, the Jews are saying to Jesus. And Jesus replied, For if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. And verse 44, for you are the children of your father, the what? The devil. And you love to do evil things he does. It was a murder, and it's in red because Jesus spoke it. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of what? Of lies. You see, the Jews are trying to convince Jesus that they're good. But Jesus knew knew better. We're filled with sin. We come from the human lineage. And the cancer that we all have is S-I-N, sin. Verse 12 says, so on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated it. See, it came from Haman, not the king. Haman was in charge. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respective provinces, and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Verse 13, dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, annihilated on a single day. Can you imagine how Haman is feeling? I almost got you. That was scheduled to happen on March 7th, the month of Nisan of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. So the people of God are now becoming aware of the horrible pogrom. Or in other words, the Jews were aware that they were going to be massacred. 
in one year's time, they were going to be massacred. That Haman and the people of the provinces would descend upon them, annihilate an entire population, and that the edict now begins to gain strength and influence, and yet on the very next day, the people of God didn't forget to celebrate what? Passover. It's like if we forgot to come to church on Sabbath because there was an earthquake yesterday. In other words, the Jews still said, we're going to honor God because we remember how God, what? Delivered us. There's power in remembering the blessings and the miracles and the answered prayers from God. Amen? There's power in remembering how God delivered whatever ethnicities in the world not just the Jews, but whatever ethnicities in the world that have been delivered and rescued, there's power in remembering how you were delivered. I come from a family that my parents were immigrants. And there's not a day that goes by when my mom, because my father passed away a number of years ago, that my mom is so grateful to be an American citizen. My mom didn't have a bad life in Colombia, but she had a poor life in Colombia. Her sons have a better life than what she had, and she's grateful for that. So the people of God are now becoming aware of this potential massacre, but they still want to celebrate celebrate Passover. The reason they gathered to celebrate the Passover is to remember in their history that when they were in an, an impossible situation, in the bondage of Egypt, that God miraculously intervened and set them what? Free. You all have that story. We just don't remember it enough. We've all been delivered some way or somehow, and we have to remember that. I got a letter this week, and I was so grateful because the letter said that I have no more bacteria in my body. And, um, you know, I had never been sick in my life. I would never been in a hospital in my life. And so for me, it was traumatic. It was lonely. It was hard. It was hard to be in the hospital especially when my wife or, or friends were gone and I was there by myself because I had never been in the hospital. And so those things, I remember God's grace. You know, Jesus is the great physician. Amen? He's the great physician. So in my prayers, I say thank you, Jesus, for being my great physician. So now the edict of Haman, established by the king, pronounces that, the, that their destruction is inevitable. And they are now left with either the celebration of God's miraculous intervention or the prospect of no intervention. Let's look as we close this morning at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because the very means that Satan sought to bring about the destruction of the purpose of God was the means of how God gave victory through the power of the cross. Satan thought that by murdering Jesus on the cross that he was going to gain the victory over Jesus. But we know better because of the power of the cross. Amen? And that's the way God works. He worked for our behalf. What Satan thought I'm going to hang Jesus on an instrument that only criminals die of and die on. God said, no, there's going to be power here. Verse 14, a copy of his decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all the people so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. They were ready to pounce. Verse 15, at the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers. And it was also proclaimed in the fortress, in the palace of Susa. 
Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, to get drunk. But something happened. Something miraculously happened because now Susa fell into what? Confusion. And that's not by accident. It's not by accident that Susa falls into confusion. Finally, the confusion in the city. We have the promotion of Haman, the reaction of Mordecai, the destruction of the Jews. And now we're told that Susa fell into confusion. The king, the epitome, this king is the epitome of Edmund Burke's statement that says, quote, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, good women to do what? Nothing. And that means us as Christians. We can sit back and let some woman that's a neighbor be harmed by her husband and do nothing. Or we can rise and be Christians and help her. Amen? We can be of help. We're called to be helpers. The irony is the fact that this queen... Queen Esther was a Jew. And Mordecai, who had saved the king from the assassination attempt, was also a Jew. So as I close, we're going to give you three very valuable lessons from three major characters of this story. First, from Mordecai, we learn, never forget there will always be someone who will resent your devotion to whom? To whom? To the Lord. Never be ashamed to say that you are a Seventh day Adventist Christian. Amen. Never be ashamed to say that you love Jesus Christ and that He's your Savior. Because that's what Satan wants to put you in a position that you're embarrassed to say it because everybody else isn't a Christian. Never forget there will always be someone who will resent your devotion to the Lord. It started like this in Persia, a Jew not bowing down to Haman. Secondly, from Haman we learn never underestimate the diabolical nature of evil and revenge. It's a cancer. A lack of forgiveness that stays on the back burner in your life has the ability to poison your life like cancer if you allow it. We're human beings. We can be poisoned by cancer too. Matter of fact, Satan is working overtime to poison your life more than those who don't know Jesus. He wants to poison your life with some other member in the church that has upset you. He wants to poison your life so that you're dissatisfied because something happened at church and you're disgusted with it. He wants to poison your life because... Some other Christian did something that's so bad in this world. I remember I was in seminary and Dr. Pauline came into class and said there was a massacre going on in Rwanda. The Hutsis and the Tutsis. And he said the unfortunate aspect is that some of those who were fighting against each other were Seventh-day Adventist Christians. That's Satan's plan. Third, from King Xerxes, never overestimate the value of your importance. It's so easy to be blinded by one's own pride of position and power. It is for this very reason that God came into our polluted world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. We're not able to help ourselves, but Jesus can. Amen? He opened the door to forgiveness because of the power of the cross of Calvary. Jesus let nails be driven into his hands and his feet and he hung and died on the cross of Calvary so that whomever would believe in him would never perish in their own sin and or evil. You see, Satan wants you to believe that your sins can't be forgiven and that you're going to feel such a burden of guilt that you don't want to go to Jesus in prayer. That's what Satan wants, to, wants you to feel. I, I, I have such a bad sin that I committed that Jesus isn't going to forgive me. He's going to forgive you and cleanse you 
from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. In a mirac- oops, excuse me. In a miraculous way, the blood that came from his body serves as an internal detergent that washes away our sins. What can wash away my sins? The church says, I can't hear you. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It might not make sense to some secular person, a non-Christian, but to you and me, there's power in the blood. Amen? So as I close this morning, in God behind the scenes, little did Haman know that God was in charge and that Haman, this evil villain, was going to become the victim of his own evil plan. Yet the discouragement, terror, or evil faced by God's people today, that means us, should drive us to look to Jesus who has promised that he would deliver us to the very end. Amen? Proverbs says this to us as we leave this morning. The name of the Lord is a what? Strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. Dear Jesus, thank you for reminding us that you are our fortress. That no matter what Satan pulls on us, no matter what he wants to do in our lives with sin, that we can come before the throne of grace, confess our sins to Jesus, and Jesus is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, as we have journeyed through these first three chapters of the book of Esther, we see a real-life drama, a real-life story that happened over 2,000 years ago. May we learn from the, the, the relevance of this incredible story, this incredible book called the Bible. And may we not only learn from it, but may we grow in wisdom and grace. And so now, Lord Jesus, Be with us as we leave this place of worship. May we be a blessing to others and to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. And the family of God said, amen Amen and amen.